I am, um, I've been trying to get a message across to the American Jewish community for many years. I have a long-standing interest in intermarriage as a major factor affecting Jewish life. Um, my dissertation, which I started in 1972, finished in 74, was on inter-ethnic marriage and friendship. I just want to point out that I, I have been concerned about this topic legitimately for, uh, you know, professionally, for over 40 years, and I remain deeply committed to the whole issue of, of policies, uh, um, understanding, and, uh, and, and, and practices related to, to intermarriage. I'm going to explain why, and explain what I think we should do, and explain why I have difficulty in getting this message across, and I want, want your help and your comment and your and your, and your responses. And then we'll, maybe we'll do a little survey, find out how many of you are intermarried, how many have children intermarried, and so forth and so on. So I, I, so I guess I'll, I'll just start personally. Um, my grandparents on my father's side had six children, one of whom was killed in a car accident and as, a, as, a, as a child on the Lower East Side. And they moved to Brownsville as a result. So they were left with, fi they were left with five children. These five children, um, all, they all married. One married a non-Jew, and he had no children. That's his, Uncle Sally is the eldest one. The others married Jews, and they all had either one or two children. Um, one, one of those never married. That's my, my cousin Jeffrey never married. He, um, he's never had children. Uh, Cousin Richard had one child, cousin uh, Rich, uh, Rochelle and, uh, and, uh, and Arthur each had two kids, and I had one, one, one boy that I raised as a, my, my previous wife's child by her, her previous marriage, and I have my own daughter, Edith, who lives in Tel Aviv, who was about to, about to be 30 years old. Moral of the story is that my grandparents had five living children, and the only person who was likely to continue their, you know, kind of Jewish DNA, and it's not, it's not done yet, but it looks, looks pretty good, is my, my daughter, Edith, living in Tel Aviv. They're all... Is she married? She's living with her chaver, and it looks like it's, it's, you know, set. He's talking about having children. She's talking about getting married first. So they'll, they'll figure it out. They'll, I'm sure that'll happen. She, she, wanted to, she also wanted to get a job before she got pregnant. She just got hired by the this district attorney's office of Tel Aviv. It's a very, very nice position. She's, she's going to be a prosecutor. Um, so Edith has a really, Edith is the one person. That, the other's like, I have a cousin's grandson. No, I have a, I have a cousin's son. Sorry, cousin's grandson, who I've never met. He's the only one. Who's the only one named from my anybody in my family? His his name is Max Whitaker. My father was Max Cohen, but before the Cohens were Cohen, they were Chotaike, which would have been Whitaker. But my they couldn't pronounce it. And my grandmother was a, was was Cohen, and my grandfather is Chotaike, and he was a Cohen. So he took her name. Early feminist. I'm named after him. Um, anyway, Max Whitaker is the only person named after my any my parents. He ain't Jewish. His, his mother's not Jewish, and like, like not, I don't mean halakhically, I mean like not being raised Jewish. So th this is my family. This is my, this is, this, this is, I, in other words, I'm very familiar with intermarriage, and um, I'm very aware of its con consequences for continuity. So now let's go from the personal to the collective, like Jews. Um, uh, a few, a few, Numbers just to get get you in the in the swing of things and why I'm so concerned. Um, the Orthodox population of America and actually the world is expanding fairly rapidly. Orthodox Jews have about 4.1 children on average in the, in the United States. Haredi Jews have about five plus children. Hasidic uh, uh, people have about 5.8 or 5.9 children per 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 per, uh, per woman as where they count whether she gets married or not on, on average. Families have even, you know, married couples have even more. There are more Hasidic children in the eight counties of the New York area than there are conservative and reformed kids put together. Just, like, just remember that. 
um, um, a lot of the reasons for the orthodox growth and the impending non-orthodox shrinkage is, has to do with intermarriage, and the other one, of course, is fertility. Um, uh, we non, most, most, of, most of us in this room, I'm, I'm going to assume, are non-orthodox. Um, certainly, not, we're not, I see no visible signs of Haredi orthodox sitting in the room. I could be wrong. Um, with women, it's harder to tell, but men, for sure. Um, uh, we have, on average, uh, about 1.7 uh, children, not all of whom are raised Jewish, and not all of whom grow up to be Jewish, even the, the, those who are raised. The 1.7 uh, include the children of the intermarried. Um, we, when I married, I told you, I wrote my dissertation in 1972. I was concerned about Jewish intermarriage then. I wrote about inter-ethnic marriage and friendship. At that point, there was a study done, the NJPS, National Jewish Population Study of 1971, told us that there were about 22% recently uh, recent rate of intermarriage was 22%. In the current Pew study of 2013, we found that there's an overall intermarriage rate of 58%, but that's divided between the currently orthodox and everybody else. For everybody else, the intermarriage rate is 71.5, or 72%. Out of every 10 people who do, in fact, marry, not all of whom do, but let's, 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 we'll get back to that, of every 10 people, three marry Jews, seven marry non-Jews. If your reform or you have, you're raising, raising a child in the, in the reform movement, the chances of marrying a non-Jew are 8 out of 10. Two marry Jews, 8 marry non-Jews. Um, now, it turns out that intermarrying Jews um, tend to produce fewer Jewish children, but it's not so terrible uh, if, uh, if we would get half of the people, to, of the kids to grow up as Jews. It, it turns out that at least until now, and the, there may be a shift going on, but at least until now, of those people who had a Jewish parent, but not two, had only, only had one, 43% identify as Jews today. It's like it's kind of, it turns out not to be terrible because um, we don't need all those people to, we, we, don't, we only need half of them to identify as Jews. The reason is when you have two Jews marrying each other, you use up two Jews. But when you, when you have a Jew marrying a non-Jew and a Jew marrying a non-Jew, you only use up one Jew at a time. So you only need one of the two Jewish families to produce a Jewish litter in order for, in order for the population to stay even. So it turns out that, uh, that intermarriage in the first generation isn't all that destructive to Jewish continuity. The problem is the types of Jews intermarried people raise, and their subsequent behavior. So, to move on, um, the 43% um, the, uh, the are divided half and half as are younger millennials who have a 59% rate of identifying as Jews. They're divided half and half between Jews by religion and Jews with no religion. Now, we want to be very clear. These are Pew Research Center terms. Um, Jews of no religion is possibly a misnomer. Um, it doesn't mean secular Jews. I myself regard myself as a secular, moderately observant, sometimes shom shomer, not exactly shomer Shabbos, but sh shul-going Jew married to a rabbi um, who keeps kosher with kosher people. I mean, like, I, that, that makes me a secular Jew. We're not talking about secular Jews. We're talking about people who were asked question number one. With which of these religions do you identify? Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Hindu, Muslim, da 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 da, da. Uh, and they say, mm, I don't know, none of those are agnostic. Okay, question number two. Do you consider yourself to be Jewish, partially Jewish, or not Jewish? And, and of those who are Jews, half say partially and half say Jewish. Those are Jews with no religion. I call them Jews on second thought, like, because, because the first question they're not really answering a religion question. They're asking basically, are you Jewish? Like, that's the way America asks you, are you Jewish? And then they say, no, no, not that. Oh, but yeah, I consider myself partially Jewish. Anyway, those people are half of the children of, the, of, the, of those who are Jewish of the intermarried. And it turns out the people who are Jews of no religion raise their own children as non-Jews, non-non-non-Jews, two-thirds of the time. All I'm trying to try to say is that the children of the intermarried are, are 
more weakly socialized, have weaker Jewish identities, such that when the children of the, of the intermarried marry, 91% marry non-Jews. The intermarriage rate goes even higher. If they're raised Jewish, 83% marry non-Jews. Of people who have a non-Jewish parent who are married, only 7% are raising their children as Jews by religion, um, which is a, turns out to be a very, um, a, just a, a minimal category for extended Jewish identification. So we, we lose large numbers of Jews, not so much in the first generation or the, 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 the children of the intermarriage, but in the next generation. And, to, and in this day, we see that there are significant declines in the number of Jews who are out there and the number of Jews who are out there and who are doing anything. Between ages of 50 and 69, we have about 1.7 million Jews. Between 30 and 49, we have about 1.2 million Jews. And the 1.2 million are less active in Jewish life than the 1.7 million, such that on average for anything you can pick, and I don't mean, you know, I, I include klutzy, old-fashioned measures like do you belong to a Jewish organization, do you belong to a shul, you know, all the, including those, but also including do you have Jewish friends, do you think Jewish is being, being Jewish is important, are you emotionally attached to Israel. We have all kinds of ways of measuring being Jewish. Those numbers are coming in between 55 to 60 percent of the previous generation. In other words, we, are, we right now are going through Jewish population meltdown. I see it. It's in the data. There's nothing to contradict it. Now, if I was right, you would, might see conservative synagogues closing or merging, the conservative movement having to sell its building, um, the reform movement having to fire lots of rabbis a, a, a couple of years ago. You might see federation donations kind of dragging and the number of federation donors declining. Um, you might see you, you, you might see all kinds of, uh, oh, you might see fewer kids in non-Orthodox day schools. And you might see these things, only, if only what was, I was saying is true. Guess what? Everything I just mentioned is happening. It's happening right now. We're, we're living through this. So I, so I have been trying to open up the eyes of the Jewish community and say, look, this is going on. And it's going on in part because we have low fertility, um, few, few, relatively few children, not that much different from Americans of equal social class and equal education who are not, who are not from, you know, they're not from Mormons, they're not from Christians, they're like non-from people have about 1.7, uh, 1.8 children, it's like, like where, where we are. Um, uh, and, and, and the other, an, another fact, the reason, part of the reason that we, we don't have children is that we don't get married. Um, of Jews between 40 and 49 who are non-Orthodox, which is like kind of largely getting past, not entirely getting past the childbearing age, they've gone through the, the 18% of them have never been married. It's an incredibly high number. We have never had 18% of Jewish 40-somethings who never got married. That is, it's just, right, it's, it's, it's just um, unbelievable. Um, and. And, and they're large, although well, it's possible, and, and those essentially single mothers or single fathers who do manage to have a child uh, w without a partner are, should, be, should be heroized and supported. It just doesn't happen very often. So we're talking about taking almost 18% of the population off of the childbearing track, which is part of, the, part of this problem. Uh, just one other number. There are 7.2 million people who had a Jewish parent who are adults today in America. 2.1 million of them do not think they're Jewish. They're not 29%, 29% of those who have a Jewish parent do nothing. Like, I'm talking about real Neshamas, real people. We've lost them. They're not here. They're not, they're not, they're not part of the population. What do they think they are? Everything, everything else there is to be. Yeah. You know. Do they consider themselves Christians? No. Or non, I, I, don't, I don't consider myself a Jewish. Largely, largely um, non-religion, you know, like people. They have who they, they are who they are. Some actually consider themselves Christian, but but they don't when they don't they don't meet Pew's criteria of this is Jew that's not a Jew and that that's about right. I mean, it's, it's, you know. so so now um, what can we do about this? It it turns out that all Jewish social cohesive education 
activities. They all raise the in-marriage rate, and they also may uh, raise the marriage rate. But they, but they certainly raise the, the in-marriage rate. In other words, if you, I, I did, a, did several studies of Jewish camps. Well, the most recent is called Camp Works, because it's Camp Works. Um, and, and, you, and you find out that if you went to a Jewish camp, and we didn't ask, did they teach anything there? Did you have any Shabbos there? Did you do, was it, you know, was it like one of these heavy-duty Jewy camps, like, you know, Camp Ramah, or say nothing of URJ, right? No, we didn't ask that question. Oh, yeah, I was like, did you go to Jewish camp? Um, and then years later, controlling for everything, taking out the fact that some of them came from stronger Jewish homes, we see long-lasting effects, um, you know, at least 10% on the in-marriage rate, higher on Shabbos and sh shul going, whatever. We have similar effects for, did you belong to a Jewish youth group? Um, we have similar effects for, did you go to, by the way, did you go to Israel? Birthright has actually very good research on birthright, no birthright, apply, didn't apply, when, you know, when a birthright, didn't go to birthright. And it has a huge effect on the, on the in-marriage rate just a few years later. So we know how to raise the in-marriage rate. It just costs money. We just got to send Jewish kids to Israel, send them to Jewish camp, lower the cost of camp, uh, supply more youth group professionals who can recruit more youngsters to Jewish youth groups. How do I know this? Because there are two youth groups that have a lot of money behind them, BBYO and Lynch Schusterman and um, uh, NCSY and Coca-Cola. Are you saying that camps are more effective than day schools? Oh, on, on this stuff? Uh, day schools, no, day schools overall have a higher effect, but it's just cost effective to invest in camps because day schools cost a lot of money and we can't manage to convince people with money to go to day schools. There's only a small group of people who are up for grabs for day school. There's a, the Orthodox who will send their kids to day schools under the worst of circumstances. They're the Reform and non-denominational and certainly the intermarried, who you can't drag into day schools, even if you, you, if you, you give them and say, here's day schools, and here's a, an admission to Columbia, Harvard, Stanford, and Princeton, all rolled together, you'll pick later. You will, that, that won't work to get people in day schools. They just don't like it. They're, they're, I, I don't want me because, because they're, they're ghettoizing. However, almost everybody is available for camps. Almost everybody is available for, for youth groups. And we know from birthright that, that a huge fraction of population is willing to go to Israel if only you made it free or low cost. So we need to get 16 to 17 year olds to go to Israel. And my article in the forward this past week says that says precisely that. I, looks like I already have hands before I'm even talking about my problem. So tell me about my problem. To what extent is there a preselective bias where the, the kids right. who are going to birthright or the kids who are going to Jewish school? It's all factored out. We, 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 look, we look at um, all the prior factors, parents and married, denomination, um, Jewish schooling, other you know, Jewish youth groups, other correlative factors that predict whether you're going to be involved in this activity or not. And to the best extent possible, we factor out um, uh, selection bias, if that's what you're asking about. Yeah, yeah, we, we, that's... That's, you know, move on my lap. It's no, or, or, yeah. So, one, one statistical one. Nora? Nora. Yeah. Hi, Nora. Um, my understanding was in terms of Jewish day school, that whether, where one went to high school seemed to be more significant, my understanding of, of previous research, than K through 8, and that's where lived Jewish camping had a, a, a strong effect yeah. um, for the adolescent group. And the personal side for me is what part of what brought me here. I have four kids. All four went to day school. All four went to, were in youth group. And all four have been multiple times in Israel. Three of the four are with non-Jewish mm -hmm. partners. One is made Aliyah and is with uh, someone who's Chiloni, not Dati. There, look, in, in, any, in any family, um, there, there are always counterexamples. And actually, in any family, it was something we don't know. You have this fam the same family, more or less, right, S similar inputs, and then you have three kids. You have four, actually. And the, and the three kids are very disparate in the ways in which they're Jewish. Like, I know, I know a family, this kid's a rabbi, this kid's married to a non-Jew, non I don't know the third kid. So, so there are all these psychological and other factors, and like anything else, and this is like a, a public health approach, uh, we can only affect 
the major vectors of change, and I, you know, I, I certainly can't explain, you know, the the, uh, the outcomes in in your case. Were you in New York, New York area? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. The West, Chester. I, yeah, I can't. I, I like. I'm looking for something. Good. Like <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't make. And then we, you know, like not in public, we can talk about it a little further and find out what what was going on. There was like there were some other issue, issues, obviously. Um, uh, but we can, we'll go further. I'm, I, I'll take a couple more comments and then I'll go back to where I'm, where I'm going, but Allison. Just a clarification. In the beginning, yeah. oh, thank you. In the beginning you talked about your family and you said yeah. that out of the, the young people in it that only one would, or one. possibly two would continue one. with, only one, two. okay, would continue with Jewish DNA. Can you explain what you mean by Jewish DNA? Oh, the, 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 um, the, 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 God willing, will have children, and they'll be raised as Jews. So raised as Jews is how you're defining Jewish DNA. Yeah, that was like a kind of a quickie. The, 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 the DNA that came from my grandparents, who had all these children, will find Jewish residents only in the, their great-granddaughter's children. And I, I deeply regret that. Physical DNA? Are you their physical DNA will only will reside in people who identify themselves as Jews, and, and you know, and the, the others will not, the other, the other progeny, just will not say that I'm Jewish. I mean, halakhically, there may be Jews along the way. I, I, I think, as a sociologist and as a secular Jew, I'm not that particularly concerned about the halakha, um, except as, as a cultural phenomenon. So there are probably there are there are halakhic Jews in, in there someplace. I've got, I've got to figure out who's who's who. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about having a fifth generation after, after uh, Sam and, and, and Dora who say, hi, I'm Jewish. Um, and they'll, they can look down and then say, we did all this, and all we got was this. What happened? What, 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 what did we go wrong? And, and, and I'm, I'm concerned. And so that was using it as a, as a poignant example to illustrate the larger phenomenon of the 72% and 2.1 million and then, and then like, I'm, yeah, I, I was just curious about your definition. So thank you for clarifying. Yeah, what, what, what were you worried about? No, I'm not worried. I'm just curious. Cause no, you're worried. <laughs> <laughs> the way you phrase Jewish DNA, it, it could imply an inherent difference in our DNA. It could mean physical. It could mean emotional. It could mean spiritual. So I was wondering where you yeah. were coming from no, personally. I'm, I, am, I am pro, I'm ext if you just to get that be very clear, I am hugely pro-conversion. I, um, I have one article, I, I've, I've written articles already about Jewish cultural affirmation. If you don't want to convert, then culturally affirm that you're Jewish without, without religious conversion. Uh, I have another article in the, in the in works which is saying lower the barriers to religious conversion and employ more rabbis who will do conversion. And then when, once we get that one out, the next one is going to say, and if you don't want to, you want to become Jewish without conversion, I'm all, uh, I'm all for that. So I just, like, I'm, I am so hugely for bringing people into the Jewish people to identify as Jews that, um, a, a, shall we say, a racialist version of DNA is not what I'm talking okay, about. Okay, great. That, Thank you for clarifying. That's what, that, I, I know you were asking that question. I just wanted to get it out of you, but all right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. How, how, how do we talk about this in a way which can get people to adopt policies? Because everybody, including me, We've got intermarriage all over the place in our lives, and we're worried that the way we talk about intermarriage will offend young people and, and others and the intermarried. But how do we, so that we don't talk about it. If we don't talk about it, how do we like, think about policies which will actually make this happen? Because if we don't, then what we're going to have is a shrinking Jewish population and lots of people with, yes, Jewish DNA, who I think ought to be Jewish and and it's a great loss to my people, because I really, really care for them. Um, and we're going to have a smaller Jewish population. Uh, it's also going to be more heavily Orthodox, which that's OK. Um, but it's going to be fewer Jews who are not Orthodox. And we will not be able to do the Jewish mission. We, won't, we don't, can't do anything that we really care about. We won't educate children. We won't contribute to a better society. We won't be flaming liberals. We won't, we, we, we won't, won't, we won't stop the occupation in, in Israel. We won't do all those things because we don't have progressive, liberal, non-Orthodox Jews around who care about being Jewish. So how do we get from here to there? And, and I don't know, but I'm, gonna, I'm trying to stay healthy 
for many, many years so I can keep making this case. So I need your help in talking about this. Or you can easily question, oppose, criticize what I say, challenge me. It's really, really OK. Just please try not to walk out, if at all possible. <laughs> Well, you heard the way I talk. You have different environments in which you speak. Like, does something I say really like offend you? And like, oh, you Stephen, don't don't do it that way. Like, or or here's what I would say, and here, I, I'd like to hear. I, I really, I really, I'm looking for serious feedback. Okay. Rucho. So I'm going to give you the other side. My son was dating a non-Jewish girl. Father was Jewish, mother was not. And oh, sorry. My son was dating. Is it on? Yes. Okay. My son was dating a girl whose father was Jewish, mother was not. And she said she thinks she's not Jewish. She thinks she's Jewish. She, she was a Jewish, Jewish studies major. It wasn't good enough for me. I'm an Orthodox Jew. I wanted to make ah. sure that my grandchildren were Orthodox. <laughs> so when he finally gave me the news, I was very upset. Uh -huh. It was nine months into the relationship. And I said, listen, she's going to have to convert. And he said, well, you know, that's a lot of work. How about she does a conservative conversion? I said, no, because I want to make sure my grandchildren are accepted as Jews by all Jews, not just by a certain segment of the population. So he said, what if we do the conservative conversion anyway? And I said, you're adults. You can do whatever you want. I'm not coming to the wedding. He said, mommy, I can't believe you're saying this. I said, I'm not coming to the wedding. They were furious at me. It took two weeks. He called me back, and he said, all right, so which rabbi do you recommend? And I, recom I rec recommended Rabbi Jonathan Rosenblatt of the Riverdale Jewish Center. He's very uh, open-minded. He has a PhD in English literature. I knew that he would be a good fit for my son's girlfriend. And she went through the conversion. She went to the mikvah. She's now Jewish. And I feel like I'm, and everybody that I tell to, everybody says like, oh, how could you? Um, I felt I had no choice. And I think there, there isn't enough pressure. And maybe I wasn't PC, but at least I got it done. Maybe there were other ways I could have done it in a more gentle way. Um, what, 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 are the, what are the risks of your policy? How did the risks could have been that I alienate both of them and they would never talk to me again. Yeah. I happen to have a very close relationship with, with my son, uh, so I guess I was just willing to take that risk, which maybe other people wouldn't. Right. But I do wish that people would, even in a gentle way, just say, so what do you think about converting? I don't think parents are asking their son's that's, that's girlfriends. That's true. Yeah, like if you, if you say it that way as opposed to right, right. if it's not a halakha from conversion. Yeah, I, right. I think you're right. You could probably get some people. So, so, on, so one, one issue that you're putting on the agenda is promote conversion in ways which are acceptable and appropriate to the, peop to the people with whom you're talking. And in your case, you did what you did and others gasp. But it's okay. <laughs> So my, my issue is I have a, um, one I have two sons. One of them right now is in a relationship with um, a girl that um, her grandfather was a Presbyterian minister. Her mother is now currently studying, getting her PhD in theology, and this girl wants nothing to do with any religion at all. So she's totally thrown everything out. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in anything. And when I speak to my son about the possibility that, because they're living together now, of them getting married, and I said, well, you know, he says, Mom, I'm Jewish. He said, I'm Jewish. I said, well, what about kids? Well, you know, they haven't discussed that yet. I said, but are you going to raise the kids Jewish? Are you going to have a bris? You know, um, you know the, whole, the whole thing. He said, Yes, you know, so I said, but how are you going to do that if you're going to be married to a woman who doesn't believe in anything or has chosen at this point in her life to throw it out? I mean, she may come back to something. So I have the issue that he wouldn't even think of asking her to convert because she's, she's saying blatantly, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in anything. So, Malcolm, let me ask a question. I, we have a w wonderful multifaceted identity as Jews. Right. And we have religious Jews and secular Jews and cultural Jews. Why not? Why not offer her the possibility that you can be a cultural Jew? Well, you, you okay. Could, so we, quite we honestly, I wasn't aware of all that until I came to this conference. That's why this conference was incredible. It's happening right here, right now. Right now. Fantastic. It's happening this whole, you know, these past three days where I was exposed to so many different people, so many different different right. ideas. I mean, I originally come from an Orthodox home. I'm not orthodox, I'm more conservative. And I think I blame myself for not 
making myself aware of all of these yeah, different... There's, there's always time to learn. All right, so, Akiva started when he was 40, you know, so it's okay. Exactly. So right. in my ripe old age, I'm now starting to learn about these things. So yes, I think something like that might be good. But I don't even know if the word conversion would come into it. I think that just the idea of, of being associated with God. <laughs> so my quest why, is really... Why, why, why God? Well, why, that's the thing. Why, like, why God? Like, I just right, want so, I'll state, I, I'll state okay. the reality. For Jews, for all other religions in America, lack of belief in God is an impediment to being a member of that religion. If, you're, if you were raised Catholic and you don't, don't believe in God, you call yourself a lapsed Catholic. If you, if you don't believe in God and you're Jewish, you call yourself Amos Oz, so, or David Grossman, or David Ben-Gurion, or, or Stephen Cohen, or a whole bunch of other people. So, so Jews actually have a whole bunch of very active Jews for whom God is either secondary, peripheral, and so forth and so on. So we have a way in for that. For that, um, it's a real situation. We have we have a possible future daughter-in-law of yours who could be Jewish, and she doesn't, and, she, and doesn't have to believe she in doesn't God. Have, she she I, I, not by me, okay. and not by most American Jews. By the rabbis, yes. Are you a but, rabbi? No. Okay. I'm married to a rabbi. Oh, okay. <laughs> But, All right. that, but she wouldn't agree. She wouldn't agree. She wouldn't agree. She would not. agree with me either. either. Right. But right. who says the rabbis own Judaism? Okay. The sociologists right. should own Judaism. No. Well, <laughs> so it's culture. Oh. So you marry her son to this cultural Jew. Let's say I that. would. You would. Yeah, okay. I'll I'll take that's your card. I don't know. I'll find out. I'll find out how to, how to do it. Like, well, there's got there's some place where when the time comes. But I guess that was my issue. So we're talking about dealing with this whole thing culturally rather than it's, it's a way in. Now, way in. it turns out I'm not against her becoming from or becoming religious. No. I'm just ha I happen to believe, by the way, if she walks in the cultural door, it might be possible, if maybe, you know, it, it's 10 years from now, you might see her learning Torah and, and, and going to Minyan in a shul. It's, it's entirely I would regard that but it was a very positive. I'm not, I'm not I'm not anti-religious. I just think it's, it's one of many good options in being Jewish, so, so is the one I'm offering. So w I think we need to expand. You know, what you're telling me is that we do need to expand. We need to tell, tell, tell Jews, you can invite your non-Jewish partners and spouses into Judaism through many doors. One door is the religious door. God bless it. But there are other doors as well that, all, that could also work. I have another question. It's about the birthright. So right now, the way birthright is set up is that you you know Jewish either right. two two parents or one parent or whatever. And you have to say you're Jewish. Why yeah. don't we have a birthright for? I, for I agree with you. Okay. I agree. I mean, I, 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 years ago I said the birthright. What's I said. Intended? Well, the end. Sorry. I, well, for for um, non, non Jewish partners of Jews. Correct. You're 100 right. But not Christian, but not from a right. Christian no, perspective. Not Christian. We're non Jews. Talking about yeah. not, not, right. all, not all non Jews are Christian. Right. Um, Since even, that has such an incredible impact. I agree with you. So okay. I once su suggested this to a leading birthright right. official, and she said to me, how would we tell the narrative of the Jewish people? I said, that's an interesting question, because my, I, I have news for you. M uh, almost all the Jews who are on the birthright program, they have mostly non-Jewish friends. So you need to t right. t teach them the narrative of Jewish people in ways that they can share that with their non-Jewish friends, otherwise they can't share it. So she like, looked at me and said, but, you know, with Sheldon Adelson's money, maybe we could, we could also expand it to the non-Jews. I, I, I don't know. It would be okay. wonderful. It's a wonderful idea, and um, uh, it, Birthright probably won't do it. But right. we, sh we we should have trips well, for now, we should have trips for mixed couples. Yeah. And 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 if there's a philanthropist, you know, a local oh, philanthropist yeah. who would say, oh, "I'll I'll do that. It's a really innovative thing, and right. I want to put my name on it." That would be a wonderful thing. Right. Okay. okay. I guess I'm in a sense worried that. Though they're going to be raised, at least they both agree to raise the children Jewish. How Jewish are they really going to be? How much commitment are they going to have at this point? To right. You have you, you have you have reason to be concerned. I mean, I'm not, this, is, this is exactly the issue we're we're talking about, and I know this from also from personal example. But I have suggested to other people, and I don't know if you're able to do this. I'm not sure it will have any impact. Is if you have any Jewish, any educational needs that can be satisfied in a Jewish context, your father and I will, will, are willing to pay for it. If you, preschool, fine. Um, day camp, us, that's us. Um, summer camp, us too. Israel travel, we're there. You want to go to France? 
It's your business. <laughs> you you want to go to you know, Camp Ar Arrowhead for anybody, wonderful sailing and computers and math da, 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 and basketball, that's your, that's your choice. If it's you know, Camp Jewish Arrowhead, it's, our, it's ours. And because we, why? Because we, we care that our children be socialized in a Jewish way. If this makes a difference to you, please, please accept us. The other, the, other, the other research shows that the presence of grandparents makes a big difference in the official identity of the children. And this is a research on, on um, how, do, how do evangelicals, Mormons, and modern Orthodox Jews manage to have high, fairly high, well, not perfect, as we see, religious retention rates. And the, one of the factors is the presence of grandparents, that grandparents are around and available, and they have good relationships with the grandchildren. And the grandchildren see their grandparents appropriately as role models, as something that's part of their legacy and their heritage. So your presence and your availability and your relationship with your grandchildren, forget like Jewish-Jewish, doesn't have to be like Jewish content, but your presence and who you are as a person uh, will affect the eventual identity choices of your grandchildren. Those are like easy, thing, easy and fun things to do. So you already want to spend time with your grandchildren. This gives you one, one, more, uh, one more incentive. I have a colleague, friend, acquaintance, who has th three children, two of whom married Jews, one of whom married a non-Jew. And, and she moved to Vermont. And he was near retire retirement age. Um, and he said, OK, we're retiring. We're, we're moving to Vermont. And he and his wife moved to Vermont to be near the grandchildren who were, in my terms, at risk. Uh, I don't know what's, what's happened since then. Actually, then he found some consulting work, and he's fine. You know. um, so uh, he happens to be a rabbi. Um, so uh, we all make, we all make these, uh, these choices. I mean, uh, um, and, and I say any way you can increase interaction with your grandchildren, which is a pleasant thing to do, will have, will have an influence. And we all, as you hear, we all live in this world. We all, we all, those of us in the room by nature are way sky high in their Jewish commitments compared to the, to the average. And we're all sharing stories about the power of America and the open world to, to and, and essentially promote the assimilation of our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. That's, that's all true. Now, in respectful and meaningful and compassionate way, how do we deal with this? It's, it's personal choices and public policy choices. So, Yes, Al, um, I'm sorry, there's one back there, then, then we'll go back the second times around. And Allison, get ready. Oh, there's one more hand, a male hand, which is actually important for diversity in this room. So we'll get you, and then Allison, you're third. Okay. Hi, um, so I have, my son is gay, and, his, and he's, his, he was raised Jewish, he's Jewish, and his partner is not Jewish, and my, my son could care less about his Judaism, right. but his partner is non-Jewish and loves Judaism. So my, my best hope loves is, your son. is with his partner. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, so that's, that's my approach. That's, okay. That's the approach. And every, every dynamic is going to be different, and yeah. it, it's possible that your son's um, distancing from Judaism is a way of establishing his individuality. Perhaps as he gets, he gets older, he'll have less of a need to do that. He'll have his own partner. And he'll feel, you know, it's not so terrible. But uh, it's, we, we, you, you never know. Bets are all off. And again, I've seen these things up, up close. And the and family dynamics, one thing about them, they're dynamic. They, they change. Relationships evolve. You have to be true to yourself, but also like, you know, not give up on the relationship because, you know, you're frustrated at the moment. Um, Things, things do, do change and, 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 and so forth. And, then, and the other, the real issue is, and we, we can do it, and I, I was just here, um, can we help m male partners, you know, husband, husbands, can we help them have children, you know, raise, raise children? So having, having your, having your, your, your facilitating having grandchildren will also be a great joy in, in your life uh, as well, God willing. Right, that was my biggest concern when he came out. Yeah. It's like, no grandchildren. Oh, no. But <laughs> we're good. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, hi. As the uh, uh, male in the room, I, I want to speak for all Jewish men. Uh, well, there's, there's, Jewish there's men. one over here. There's two back there. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't see. Well, but didn't see him. Yeah. What is this? Pardon, Richie. Richie, Richie, sorry. I have a question My for you. My old male eyes. Yeah. Uh, about your motivation or motivations for wanting to keep uh, uh, 
Jewish. That, 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 yeah, have that, have that passed down. Um, uh, and I'll explain after. My situation is that I uh, uh, have a, a daughter and a son. My son is married to a woman of Indian descent, Protestant. He doesn't care that much. He doesn't really get it uh, about the Jewish component. Uh, she's more uh, uh, spiritual, more religion involved. Uh, they had a Jewish wedding, which surprised and pleased us immensely. My concern personally is actually about their children, how they raise their children. Right. I have right. no issues with that. They're wonderful people, great couple. But I worry that the children won't be raised Jewish. Do but they have it's kids not there? so. Pardon? They have kids already. I'm sorry. No, no. Not yet. So it's all in the future. My wife won't let me ask them anything about it. Um, uh, well, about when they're having kids. Right. I drive them crazy about you know right. having bringing them up Jewish. But my motivation is not to uh, is not so much uh, uh, the larger scale uh, continuance of uh, uh, right. Judaism in any way, uh, as much as something that I think is much more selfish. I'm afraid of uh, losing a piece of connection. Uh, you know, my Jewish identity is so important to me. If those kids aren't Jewish or I watch them experience non-Jewish religious right. rituals, it could be really hard uh, and dis make for a disconnect between me and them. So I tend to think, and I may be wrong, that my motivations are sort of selfish in that way. As a policy person, I suspect you have other motivations. Yeah. The, the gums of a gums. It's like, it's like saying, if somebody if, if it was talking about declining marriage rates and wanting to see people married, which is an issue. You, you, you know, you could tell me, like, you know, I, I've had a wonderful marriage. I want my children to have a wonderful marriage. And I, it, it would pain me, it would sadden me. I'm not worried about the future of the American middle class. And that's why you know, I, I hear that. And so these different motives, the, the personal motive and the, and, the, and the collective motive are, are intertwined. They're not, necess not necessarily, they can be, not necessarily in opposition to one another. I, I appreciate your instinct. It's that instinct for personal Jewish survival. It's also, I'm also talking about collective Jewish survival. And they're both important to me. And, and I, I did express regret that Max Whitaker is named, that there's a Max Whitaker who's not Jewish in my, in my life. And it, 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 it saddens me. And it gladdens me when my daughter talks about when I have children. It was like really, when I heard her say that, I didn't prompt her. And I said, oh. This, that's, that was, that, I, tell him that's good. <laughs> Just, yeah, it's important that, we get a, that I get a job first because although there are laws in the books, um, it's not so clear that is, is Israeli employers don't discriminate against pregnant women and women with children. So first we'll go get a job and then I'll have kids. I said, this is, this is, very, this is very good news. I'm very, and you got the job. Call it, come on, fantastic. So, um, so I, I think of those terms. Allison, we, we put you off and... Um, and then you, you've been having your hand up again for a second go around, so you will. And then Brooklyn. Brooklyn, get ready. Yeah, I actually wanted to take that question further and ask, since, since that gentleman mentioned his personal story, what, what is, I mean, your argument is predicated on the idea that the dis diminishing of the Jewish people is a negative. Right. I'm hoping you could explain your reasoning behind that. Not right. that I disagree, not that I agree. Right. I'm just wondering if you could explain your own reasoning. Uh, um, if uh, there are many reasons, one is um, uh, I'm an I'm an I'm an ethnically dati person. I, I, I am religiously committed to the Jewish group, the ethnos, the people. And so, if I had a, if I could say that I was was religious, I'd give you the religious reasons, which I'm going to probably will do anyway. But for me, it's simply the ethnic analog to the religious reasons. So, back to the religious reasons. Part of my tradition is that God promised us, and we, we, we live by this, and we, 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 said, we, we said God said to us that we should be a, 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 a multitude, we should be a, a, a large people, um, like the stars of the heaven. Um, and um, he, we're promised, and we, it's part of who we are, we're a survivalist-oriented people. Um, other peoples aren't that survivalist-oriented. We are. That's why we, we've existed. Also. It's, one of, our, it's one, of, one of the things who we are. Um, third, we, despite our failings and diversity and people doing things that I, don't, I happen not to like, we 
um, we contribute mightily to the society around us and to its diversity. By the way, I wish the same good fortune for Italian Americans. I just, I'm, I'm sorry there are no Italian Americans, there are a few Italian Americans. When I was a boy, I admired Martin Luther King, and I really, I went out to meet Malcolm X. He had a demonstration near my house. I was age 15 or 14 or 15 years old. I went to see Malcolm X. Who is this, who is this guy who was pushing black nationalism? So you, you should know that that's, that's part of where this stuff comes from, a belief that, that these various groups in society have a right to survival and, are, and help society. They're, they make it more interesting and act in, generally act in ethical fashions and give people meaning and purpose. And it so happens, I mean, as opposed to all those other groups, I mean, I don't know what they have. I know what we have. We have this hugely rich culture. I mean, you know, it's Rachel Shechter reminding me that we sat on a board with, and there was, there was Yiddish, and there was, I don't know, were you, were you that from then? Were you that to you? No, you weren't, right? You went over the other side. Yeah. All right. <laughs> It's okay, we can talk about that. So, you know, but, but, I, but I, I, I actually, I light up to Orthodox and Conservative, Reform, Secular, Yiddishist, Zionist. I really, I could give you a reason why I'm attached to all those pieces of being Jewish, let alone the, 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 the Jewish diversity. So, this is like where the, you know, a variety of psychological and social and higher ideal attitudes all come together to say, boy, would I be, he's upset about his grandchildren. I'm, I'm upset for all Jewish grandchildren, and that they, that they might not be Jewish. And in my personal case, the, the one person who, is, who does have my DNA, which is my, my, my daughter, Edith, I'm not worried about Edith. You know, you know, all should be well, we'll see what happens. You know. But I'm not worried about Edith personally, but I am worried about the Jews collectively. I'm curious to know your reaction. Well, uh, the first reaction was I thought you listed yourself as non-religious, so the second one was just kind of an example, I guess. You, you listed three things just now. I have, I, I resonate with the, with the Jewish religious tradition, mm -hmm. and I feel, I, I, I feel commended by it. Sure. I, have a, I have a personal halakha, which is not the same as the, the religious halakha, but I resonate with halakha. I think, sure. I think it's a good thing. I think norms are good. I think, I think Jewish commands are a good thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I believe in them, and I, I, I try to be influenced by them. Right. And, so I understand the second and the third, the yeah. religious and yeah. the what we contribute to society. The first one I was a little less clear on. You said ethnic ethos, the people. What, what do you mean? It was like, it was, it, we don't have, we, in this society, in, in Israel and in Zionism, we have the language. We don't have a compelling ethnic language that corresponds to the religious language. We have a religious language and we know, we know, what, the, we know what that is. It's God, Torah, Halacha, rabbis, all that stuff, mitzvahs, right? Imagine that, all that, that system transported over to the ethnic side of being Jewish, which is where, where I am. So I have all that. I just, I just not accept, except for sure. deep belief in God, which, which I'm, I don't know, why don't I, where I am. But it's not, it's not, doesn't, that's, not, that's not where it starts for me. But I, I do have a, feel an obligation to 3,000 years of Jewish history. Yeah, I, and, and my family and everything else, and those other things, I, I, I think we're good. I think we're basically a, a good people who've done a lot of good in the world, and, and even we're just like average. So an average culture should survive in America, let alone a very good culture, let alone my culture. Yeah. So <laughs> my, this is mine. It's like, like you know, like, like it's, it's, you know, Chaim Weizmann was once asked, was, you know, when, he, when he debated with the territorialists over whether the future Jewish homeland should be in Israel or Uganda. And he said, it's got to be Israel. And he said, it can be anywhere. He said, that's like telling me that um, there are lots of old ladies in your, in your town who are very convenient and accessible. Why are you traveling 300 miles to visit your grandmother? You can visit old, la old ladies here. <laughs> well, you know, it's okay. You can travel 300 miles to visit your grandmother. It's, it's okay for us to worry about our own, provided we don't morph into racism and, you know, and, and all kinds of other things, which we sometimes do, and I'm really deeply upset about. Um, you can, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if you were, were you here for the last talk. Yeah, I mean, I, I have deep concerns about where Israel is going as an Israeli. Um, so uh, I, I share that agenda and that concern, but I feel very, very attached to the Jewish people. Does that, Thank you. Does that help? Yeah. Good. But we're back to you, Nora, and then, and then Brooklyn. 
Brooklyn, I, I don't mean to, because I just can't, I can't read your name tag, so I, all I can read is Brooklyn. All right. I'm sitting here. So one of the things that's very PC in, I belong to a conservative shul, is K-Roof, is bringing people in, bringing right. in the intermarried families, trying to, what I find is Chalacha doesn't always work with that. And when trying to find in ways for this greater inclusion, to me it, like I hear two little birdies. One says, great, you have, right. then they become in versus out, and the, and the ability to then perhaps better influence their children. But then there's a part of me that says, you're condoning and supporting yeah. what I deeply don't want. And if you're manipulating halakha or traditions or rituals right. to accommodate, does that dilute, you know, um, Ethan Tucker talked about integrity, the integrity of my values, what do I do with that? So if you want to talk about a systems right. looking up and down, to me, I see that very much, yeah. and I can speak for the conservative movement and not right. the other. Where, 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 where should you go to? Bethel New Rochelle. That's uh, Rabbi Cerner. Rabbi Cerner is being replaced by what's his name? Well, we don't know yet. No one's been hired. It's not what I heard, but all right. Uh, <laughs> oh, something happened <laughs> since I came to Limud? I, I, I heard somebody's on, on the line, but he's going to. All right, it doesn't matter. Well, the, well, so, okay. it's a great shul, by the way. And, the, and uh, Jack Wertheim was in your shul, right? Yes. And Bob Chazen used to be in your shul. Yes. All right. Okay. <laughs> and I, I spoke in your shul, actually, some time ago, be, before your time. Um, look. Uh, my view about the, the normative approach is that it's not, it is no longer all that effective. I'm not sure if it has no effect or a little effect, but somewhere between no and little. Like if someone, someone did a study and showed, it doesn't matter what you say, they're going to make their own choices, um, I, would, I, would, uh, I, I might believe them. So given that I am very results-oriented right now and I can't worry about the normative structure which, I have, which I've written about in the 1990s, I was all in favor of maintaining high normative barriers and, and normative reinforcement. Right now, I, am, I, I don't believe it's an effective way to achieve the results that I want, I think we all should want, which is more Jewish grandchildren. So give, given that, I would not advise Ruchel's approach to our children for all our children. Rachel gambled and won. I think, if, I think we can gamble and lose. So I would simply ask, does it make sense to have strong normative supports for in marriage when it means that we're going we're gonna to definitely lose lots and lots of our children and grandchildren? So, that, that's, it's, it's, so I'm very results-oriented. And if, you, if you, you or my friend Jack Wertheimer, who I'm seeing tomorrow, who disagrees with me, and he may be right, and I may be wrong, if I want to talk to him about this, if, if, if he, my good friend Stephen Bame, uh, with whom I'm working for many years, who I, like all, I respect all these people, if they can show me that the error of my ways, I'm willing to recant. Uh, I'm moving in this direction right now to saying that the normative barriers are ineffective and they prevent us from having open conversations with people we want to influence personally and communally. And therefore, I want to, I want to shift. But uh, understand where I'm. Understand what my where I'm going. I want. I, I want. I want your grandchildren to be Jewish, and I'll. I'll do whatever I can to make that more more likely there than less likely. Uh, Josh, I'm a second year student, rabbinical student at HUC, um, and I was just wondering if you could use the last five minutes to be highly prescriptive for how, uh, for for the the title of the talk, um, inclusion as policy in whatever exactly it was, just five minutes, highly prescriptive. Well, I, I, would, I, would, separate, I would separate the conversation, just like, as we, we've heard here, one of the themes of my, of my let me just say, highly prescriptive does not mean being uniform. Highly prescriptive means being, being, being aware of your principles and the most ethical and effective ways to achieve those ends. And, and there, there's sometimes there, there's a tension. So what I'm saying is that among policymakers, which includes rabbinical students and um, 
and Jewish sociologists and leading members of the Jewish community for many years, we ought to be able to have a free and open conversation about the impact of intermarriage. However, that conversation will be misheard and is offensive to people who themselves are intermarried or sometimes are family members of intermarried. And, 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 and we also need to be able to have a conversation in which we are um, seductive, engaging, educational towards our family members and friends who are intermarried or, and, and then are, are raising children. So that's, that's, the, that's the prescription. So you know, I, I used to be opposed to the idea of rabbis marrying Jews and non-Jews. I now say it's a matter of personal conscience. I don't think it makes a difference either way for the future. This again gets back to the, to the, normative, to the normative issue. I still s argued strongly against HUC admitting intermarried, uh, intermarried rabbis. Just not, doesn't seem, that would seem to, uh, like there's like no basis for it. That doesn't seem to help anything anywhere. It would also cause a rift between, a, a deeper rift between Reform Judaism and all, and all the others. So I'm, 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 I'm against that. Um, but these are, these are all like tough judgment calls. So, so, the, so to, to ask me, I'll, do, I'll even make prescription even more difficult for you. And it, not only is it non-uniform, um, it's non-prescriptive. It's really, it's really about searching your conscience and your intellect, your heart and your head, for wh what, what would be the most... Um, I can say, effective and ethical uh, ways to approach this problem. But the only thing I really w would um, object to is pretending as if intermarriage is just one other choice. It's like kind of moving to Arizona, you know? No, it's not moving to Arizona. Actually, moving to Arizona is actually not very good for Jewish life, but let's put that aside. But um, um, uh, it's, it's, it's something that we all need to th think about very seriously and not shy away from because it's, a, it's, it's painful and offensive. Sometimes we have to do things that are painful and offensive. Talking about intermarriage is one of those things that's important for Jewish people. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.